This morning, I'm going to warn you, it's going to have uh, some information in it. Uh, and it's a little different than many of the messages that I give you because um, it's going to have some more history in it than normal. And all we're doing is setting the stage for the, the series that we're going into over the next six weeks, including today. And um, I think you're really going to enjoy it. So I need you to put your thinking caps on. I know it's early and you probably, I hope you've had your coffee. If not, um, the cafe that may be closed, you might be stuck. So just try to stay awake uh, if, if you can. Um, but I, I think if you, if you really try and you try to connect yourself to the story, you put yourself into the story, you choose to view the story like you were going through it in the first place, I think you'll find not only is it interesting, but it will connect you to your own spiritual timeline, to your people. You're gonna see the story of you, the story of the church, the story of modern Christianity, it's the story of Jesus and how the gospel has endured through generations. So visualize, think about being alive in the first century, zero to 100, first century, 100 to 200, second century, 200 to 300, third century, the beginnings of Christianity. You, a Gentile, had seen or witnessed or heard about a prophet, a teacher being crucified. He had a following, he made some noise and you didn't pay much attention perhaps until he rose again. You knew for a fact he'd been crucified and you've seen for a fact that he rose again and he was causing a stir. And then right after he rose again, there were many people who became followers of Christ. But really the first group of people who became followers of Christ were mostly made up of Jewish people who had been looking for the Messiah, had not recognized the Messiah until they had literally seen somebody rise from the dead and many of them accepted. So this group of people right after Jesus rose again wanted to tell people about Jesus' resurrection and they took two different directions. One group went back to the Old Testament. We missed Jesus. We got to find Jesus in the Old Testament. We have to make sure we maintain the Jewish faith. We maintain the Jewish laws. And essentially, everybody who becomes a Christian has to become Jewish first. And that's what they wanted. And do you know why it would be bad for us if we had to become Jewish first? Because Judaism was not a lot of fun. The Old Testament law was not given for fun. The Old Testament law was given to show people that it was impossible to live in a way where you're perfect enough to please God. In a sense, it was given to us or to them so that as they followed through with all of these rules and regulations and commands to follow God, that it uh, reinforced the impossibility of being right and having peace with God without somebody intervening that even your forgiveness for sins couldn't be forgiven and done, but it had to be postponed, sometimes on a yearly basis, always knowing that judgment was coming and then deferring that judgment through sacrifice and through ritual. And it was the right way because it was the only way, but now it was a different way. And they were having a hard time moving forward and they said, for us to move forward, you have to become Jewish. And that's a hard sell. As you may know, all Jewish men had to be circumcised. And so if you were to come and join a church and they wanted to see your health plan before they let you join the church and schedule your surgery, it would make it a real hard thing to do to, to join the church for some people. And then you had a group of people, a much smaller group of people who said, no, the gospel is for everybody and we're gonna go forward and we're gonna share with the Gentiles, you and I, people who aren't Jewish. And they did, and we'll hear about that in a minute. But you would think that in the first, second, and third centuries, this obscure teacher, this rabbi, our Messiah, Jesus Christ, even the following that he had gathered, it wouldn't have done a whole lot. It wouldn't have gone very far because he made some noise, but yet there was persecution. They were living within a Roman government and a time in a Roman area where Christians were persecuted, they were killed, they were tortured for their faith. The Gentiles at this time really comprised two different groups, at least biblically, they were made up of two different groups. 
One was the group of Samaritans and the Samaritans you've heard about a lot in scripture. And the Samaritans were the ones who had kind of originally been Jewish, but had sort of taken Jewish faith and made it their own. They made their own church. They had their own Pentateuch, first five books of the Old Testament. They had their um, own idea that they were the true religion and that they were the true followers of Abraham and the Jewish people hated their guts. And then you had the Romans and there were a whole lot more Romans than there were Samaritans or Jews. And the Roman culture was literally messed up. And sometimes we say, can you believe how bad our society is? And oh my goodness, it's so terrible. And Jesus has to be coming again tomorrow. And I remind you, if you know church history, if you know world history, that we don't live in a society right now that's nearly as bad as societies have been in the past and civilizations. And Jesus may come tomorrow, but it's not because ours is the worst it's ever been. In Roman society, they worshiped many gods. They were usually gods passed down from father to son or family to family. They were represented by an idol. You could put your gods in a bag and you could move from one place to the other and put your gods out and have a worship service. If you needed to have kids, you'd buy a God of fertility and you'd worship the God of fertility. If you were running low on funds, I guess you'd borrow a God of funds and the God would bless you. And the, uh, the religious um, landscape was that the gods toyed with people. They weren't compassionate, they weren't loving, They weren't merciful. They toyed with people and the people manipulated the gods trying to stay one step ahead and get what they wanted. Sexually, the Romans were literally perverted. Um, The only people who really had restrictions on their sex life were the married women. And they, of course, were supposed to be um, confined in their sexual activity to the marriage relationship. But as far as the men were concerned or the unmarried women, they could do whatever they wanted with whomever they wanted. And they did. And a lot of times it had to do more with dominance than it did love or an expression of love. And this Roman society, when mixed with this Jewish society, I mean, it freaked people out. The Romans thought the Jews were weird, standoffish, and judgmental. And the Jews thought the Romans were then for hell. I mean, they were the worst of the worst. They were like Mardi Gras in Las Vegas on a weekend, all wrapped up into one with no chaperone and an unlimited budget and no conscience. I mean, it scandalized them. And one of the things about the Romans is, is they decided they didn't like Christians, Jewish or otherwise, and they began to kill them. Nobody knows how many Christians were killed in the first three centuries, thousands. And they were killed because they did not comply to the Roman system, but they also were blamed if a plague or a pandemic happened. Christians were blamed, they were rounded up and they were killed. If a recession happened, Christians were blamed, they were rounded up and they were killed. And so it was sort of sporadic or cyclical But there were times when Christians were rounded up. They were questioned. Where are your secret churches? There were no public churches anymore. They were hiding. Who are your people? Who follows Christ? You confess, say you don't follow Jesus, we'll let you go. People were dying for their faith. They were watching their families die for their faith. They weren't turning their friends in. And over this first 300 years, instead of Christianity dying out, it was thriving. And the persecution, even though unthinkable, galvanized the church around the message of a person, Jesus Christ, God. And as they rallied around this person, they endured and the persecution continued. Tertullian, living in the third century was an apologist. He became a Christian. He was the son of a Roman centurion, became a believer at the age of 40, which was really late back in that day. The Romans, they didn't live a long time. People didn't back then, but especially if you live like a Roman, your life expectancy wasn't super long. So he was kind of an old man at 40 years old. Um, He was famous for a quote. And what he said was, if the river is too low and the crops die, Or if the river overflows its banks, the Nile, and the crops have too much water and they die, the solution that the Roman government always has is throw more Christians to the lions. 
And so it was a bad time to be a Christian if you wanted a long life, but a good time if you wanted to understand what real community was, what sacrifice was, how powerful Jesus was. And it continued until a man named Constantine was getting ready to go to battle with another general named Maximilian. And Constantine the Great, he was from the South. Maximilian was a general from the North and both armies were very well matched. They were close in size and close in strength. They were gonna meet at this bridge. They were fighting over control of Rome. And history tells us, and it's been verified and repeated for years and years, started with people closest to Constantine, the Constantine, not a believer at the time, went out into the woods and was walking around and he was like, God, if there's a God, I don't wanna lose this battle and I don't wanna die. So what do I need to do? History tells us that he looked up and in the clouds, he saw the shape of a cross. He went to bed that night and he had a vision or a dream. And the dream was that if you put the sign of Christ, he felt God was talking to him, the chi and the rho, the P and the X, if you put this on the banners that you fight under and you put this on your shields, that you will win. And so Constantine wanted to win. And of course he took out his paint, he marked his shields, he marked his banners. They went to war, he won. He defeated Maximilian, he legalized Christianity. And for a period of time, there was peace. It was okay to be a Christian. He even built some churches. There was a song that we sing and used to sing especially that actually was written about this um, incident. His banner over me, his banner over me, his banner over me is love. Any of you old school Christians like me recognize that song? Is it just me that had that upbringing? There are a few of you, right? I'm not gonna sing it for you. There we go, a lot of us do, right? For those of you who aren't, it's just weird things we remember and do about the way we came up. It was kind of a cool song. That's where it came from. Now, eventually Christians began to fight because that's what Christians do. They were no longer galvanized by persecution and persecution came and went and then corruption came and there's lots of stories we're not gonna talk about today. But I wanna take you right back to the beginning where this group of leaders had to decide who is Christianity for? What is it a person needs to do to become a follower of Christ? So they had their first church business meeting have you ever had a business meeting? You ever been to a business meeting in church? Um, anyone ever been to one? There are a few of you. Again, if you haven't been to one, I don't recommend going. Um, but um, business meetings are the way, at least in modern church history, that um, congregations govern the church and, and they're known for being divisive and you know, not everybody's divisive, but sometimes they get nasty. And I can remember as a young seminary student, I was on staff at a little church in Dallas and um, one of my fellow staff members, he was like, we're having a business meeting tonight. And I said, great, I'm skipping. And he goes, no, you gotta come. And uh, I said, I'm not gonna come. He goes, no, it's gonna be great. They're gonna fight, you're gonna love it. We're gonna sit in the back. It's like watching wrestling and Jerry Springer all wrapped into one. You're not gonna believe how these people act. And so I did, I went and sat in the back with them and we're kind of sitting up on the pew on the back row and we're watching. And they go through the agenda and they talk about how much staples cost and if, whether they should buy envelopes at you know, Office Max or, or whatever it was. And, and all these little trivia things that take up business meeting time. And then they got to the real agenda and they're, I realized seated on separate sides of the church based on their, their, their perspective, they came to fight. And they raised the issue. Is the Baptist hymnal inspired by God and should be considered the same level as scripture or not? Now in the back I'm rolling going, what do you mean the Baptist hymnal? It wasn't just the hymnal, it wasn't just hymns, it was the Baptist hymnal. And they thought it was inspired like scripture. And if you wonder, I'm telling you it's not. The Holy Spirit inspired scripture, all of it, not the hymnal. The hymnal has truth in it, just like lots of things do but it's not inspired by God. They fought. Well, finally, and I mean, they were yelling back and forth. It was as entertaining as it could be. It raised my blood pressure a little bit. The side who believed it was inspired by God won. So this side over here is sheepish and sitting down and this side literally congratulating each other for being the defenders of the faith and the protectors of all that's holy. Then they got into a fight about which edition of the Baptist hymnal is inspired by God. Two old men in the front stood up, squared off and said, let's go outside and settle this like men in the parking lot. And so, you know, that's 
a terrible way to solve church disputes, but you may have seen similar behavior. I know I have. This business meeting was different. These were people who genuinely loved the Lord, who genuinely wanted to see the church started, Christianity, this, mo this movement started and protected because they believed so passionately in this man that they decided to meet together and to discuss their grievances in their first church business meeting, the council at Jerusalem, the Jerusalem council. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you're circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. Paul, the one who wrote much of our New Testament after the gospels, Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some of the other believers to go up to the Jerusalem or to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, and I want to stop there for a second. Did you hear what I said? I said, some believers who used to belong to the party of whom? Oh, I'm going to go to this side of the room. The answer is on the screen. So some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, who was responsible just a few years earlier for killing Jesus, the Pharisees. Now they're Christians, not all of them, some of them. Could you imagine the time when someone responsible for waging accusations that Jesus literally standing by as he is tortured and crucified, seeing him risen again and saying, oops, my bad. I mean, how bad can you be? So they go to the apostles, to whatever Christian leaders there were and said, I'm sorry, we were wrong. Will you forgive us for killing Jesus? And you know what? They did because it's what you do when you follow Christ. And they modeled it from the beginning. And so these Pharisees, they're just stuck. They're just trapped in the way they were raised, scandalized by some of the traditions and some of the legalism and some of the politics that, that confuse them. I have compassion for them. But we see that they stood up and they said the Gentiles must follow the laws in the Old Testament. The Gentiles must become Jewish. The Gentiles must make sure that they memorize the 615 laws and follow all of the festivals and the dinners and make the sacrifices. And we can't see any other way. And then Peter speaks. When Peter speaks, you got to listen up. Paul and Barnabas speak. The Pharisees, of course, speak. And then we hear from James. And the reason this is important is they were deciding how Christianity was going to be shared, how you and I were going to be able to embrace or choose not to embrace a personal relationship with Christ. And what, if anything, should be added to salvation by faith alone, by grace alone, and through Jesus Christ alone. And you're going to want to stick around because after we sing, we're going to wrap it up. I'm going to tell you what happened, and then I'm going to tell you what we, what we should do about it. So we're picking up where we left off, which is at this first church business meeting in Jerusalem. And it's the Jerusalem Council. And these group of well-meaning Christian leaders are trying to decide what it is that you have to know first. How is it you can become a follower of Christ? You ever had a conversation with somebody, perhaps your wife or someone else uh, or your husband, and there's something you really need to know. 
and they're going to give you some information that you really want. And as you ask them what happened or tell me, um, they give you all of the backstory and all of the details and paint this huge picture. And you're just right on the verge of your seat. And you're going, look, just tell me what I have to know and then give me the story. But if you don't tell me what I have to know right now, I'm going to lose my mind because I have to know what's the most important, what's the key. Then we'll go back and fill in the blanks. And they're trying to determine what is it? What's the key? And you have these Pharisees and they're well-meaning and they love Jesus as best they can can, but they've came from such a legalistic background and fear and rules and religion has so confined them. They're trying to break free. They're doing the best they can. I'm not mad at them. What courage would it take to go before a group of Christ followers and say, we killed Jesus? Will you forgive us? I'm for them. I'm a fan. I don't agree with what they were saying, but I agree with them. In our city group, sometimes we talk about the way we were raised. And in our church, it's probably 50-50. Probably 50% of those in our city groups were raised um, in, in churches or in religious organizations, denominations that were filled with a lot of good things, a lot of truth, but a whole lot of rules and a whole lot of culture that just wasn't biblical, but it was just kind of there. And some of these rules were probably intended to control. Maybe some unintentionally or intentionally begin to create these rules to manipulate. But the truth and the rules become blended to the point where you can't really determine one from the other. And as I was talking to a friend in between services, they said, you know, growing up, I was terrified to go to church, but I was terrified not to. Because every time I went to church, I was told I didn't belong there and how I had to behave and how I had to act and what I should be doing. And I didn't find any acceptance and I didn't find Jesus. But I was afraid not to go because I thought if I didn't go, I'd go to hell. And she said, I spent every weekend miserable. And I think that's kind of how these Pharisees were at this point where they were afraid to go, but they were afraid not to go. And they were afraid to let anybody else relax. And Jesus, through his own words, said, come to me, you who are weary and burdened by religion or by life, and I will give you rest. My burden is light. My yoke is easy. Now, the Pharisees, they just couldn't get their minds around it. It's got to be hard. Can't be fun. It's Jesus. It's church. We can't look forward to going. It's church. We have to feel terrible about ourselves when we leave. It's church. You have to obey all the rules. It's church. And the apostles are saying, wait, Jesus came to fulfill the Old Testament law. And there's a whole different set of rules that apply. And Jesus himself said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. It's a new day. And the Pharisees said, no way. And the apostles said, yeah, way. So they went and they met and they talked about it. So then Peter speaks up. And Peter said, and this is my paraphrase, please read this in Acts chapter 15. You don't have the whole story even on your screen. I gave you enough to where you can track, but I really encourage you to read this because um, there's more dialogue that I'm leaving out. Not because I don't want you to see it. I trust you'll go see it yourself. But Peter, and this is my paraphrase, he said, look, Jesus told me I should go to the Gentiles. And I said, "Uh uh-uh, I hate them. I'm scared of them. They're weird. They have no rules. I'm gonna get Gentile cooties by going into their home. And Jesus told me to go and I didn't go. And it was like 13 years after Jesus was gone that I finally went to the house of a Gentile. And you know what? When I went in there, lightning didn't strike. I didn't burst into flames. He says, guys, listen up. You know what I saw? I saw that the Holy Spirit actually indwells the lives of Gentiles too. And it blew my mind, but I saw it. And then he says, And by the way, why do you want to impose all the Old Testament stuff on all these new Christians anyway? Because your dad hated it and so do I. 
He said, it was hard. It was the way we worshiped and it was right, but it was hard. And Jesus came to show us that his burden isn't hard. Now it may be difficult to swallow our pride, to deny ourselves to follow him, but his burden is light. His yoke is easy and he gives rest. And if you can use one word to describe the period of time between Adam and Eve and the arrival of Jesus, it was restlessness. And Peter says, why would you do that? You didn't like it and I don't either. My dad didn't like it. And then Paul and Barnabas, they speak up. And Paul and Barnabas, when they started off, a lot of what they did was share the gospel with the Samaritans who were the arch enemies of the Jews. And um, they said, you know what? We've seen God do miracles in and among the Samaritans, the Gentiles and the Holy Spirit's at work in them too. And you have three different groups of people with three different opposing opinions. So then James steps up, the half-brother of Jesus, who, by the way, if you think it was all sunshine and roses being the half-brother of Jesus, he didn't believe in Jesus until after Jesus was done with the work for salvation. It took a long time. And even in the beginning of the book of Mark, it tells us how Jesus' family thought Jesus had kind of become unhinged and they were trying to pull him back home to protect himself from himself. And James steps up as an authority at the council, the Jerusalem council. And he says, it's my judgment. And he gives some very powerful words. And these are words you can write in your Bible. These are words that Pastor Dan and I and Pastor Brandon and Jared and all of our church staff that we live by as we try to decide what God wants us to do in our church. James says these things. It's my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it any more difficult for anyone who doesn't know Jesus to find a relationship with Jesus than it already is. It's my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are trying to turn to God. I preached a series or taught a series a few years ago called Dirty Church. And I told you how with many churches and many religious groups that you have to behave first and then you have to believe And then if you stick around long enough, you can belong. And in that behaving was the conformation to a religious subculture where the truth was blended with error from well-meaning people who told you what translation you had to read from, what clothes you had to wear, how long your hair could be, what you could have on your bodies who tried to, in a well-meaning way. Why make it more difficult? By making people go back to come forward. It's my judgment that we shouldn't do anything to make it harder. That you belong, you belong here at Capital City Church, you do. You come, you're part of the family. You are welcome here. Your life, you may have some issues. I have some issues. If you don't think anyone else has issues, ask around. They'll probably share their issues, right? All of us, we're honest. You belong. I want you here. You are wanted here. God wants you here. You belong. And my prayer is that you will believe. And then after you believe, then the way you live, behavior, It comes after, but it can't come first. And that's the crux of the issue here. So they put their heads together and said, okay, James said, we're not gonna make it difficult. We gotta do something because we have two groups who are warring. It's gonna be the first major church split. The Jews who are so uh, so concerned about and so afraid about you know, breaking the rules. And a lot of the Romans who have no rules and need somebody to tell them to chill out a little bit, you're scaring people, what, what are you gonna do? So they met and this is what they decided. The first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, the law, the 615 rules and regulations summed up into a couple commands. Um, don't eat food offered to idols. Don't have sex with another person's spouse. Don't eat the meat of strangled animals and stay away from blood. Seems really weird if you don't understand the culture, but this is what the apostles and church leaders were saying. Be sexually appropriate and socially considerate 
And then James drops the mic and says, you'll do well to remember these things. And off they went. And that was the message. Why these things of all things? Well, the Romans had a morality problem. And um, one of the things that was important to Jesus and is important to us as Christians is the belief that sex is expressed in a marriage relationship that's monogamous between a man and a woman. And it shouldn't be expressed in any other way because it's symbolic, it's powerful and has significance far beyond the physical. And that's important. Now, the Romans, they came from a background where there were no rules and it didn't matter. And so marriage is one of the things that's continued to be talked about in scripture. And one of the things I think that is one of the most beautiful pictures of Jesus Christ in the church. But the dietary laws, why? None of them related to sin. One of the reasons is because the church, as they were becoming believers, were all of a sudden living in community and they were meeting together. And if you tell me, come to my house, we're gonna have a church service. We're gonna have the love festival or feast as we talked about during communion week, where we get together and we eat a potluck and then have the Lord's supper. And I come to your house and I'm from a background where I am just so afraid to go to church, but so afraid not to. I'm so afraid that if I eat something that used to be terrible, that my grandma told me not to eat, that my mom and dad told me not to eat, that my pastor told me not to eat, that if I do it, I might end up going to hell. I'm just so afraid. They're not yet Christians. They're brand new Christians. They're trying to figure it out. And so they couldn't even think about going to the home of somebody who didn't have those issues and might feed them something that would cause them to have a nightmare of conscience, even if it's not real. And what the apostles did was they chose unity and they said, live in a way where you're sexually appropriate and where you're socially considerate and where you do your best to keep peace with other Christians so that they don't have a barrier or an obstacle so that we don't make it more difficult for them to come to Christ. That's really what it was about. And it's not the Jews fault because they didn't yet know Jesus or they were brand new Christians. It's not the Romans fault or the Samaritans because they were brand new Christians or they just met Jesus. Now, everyone got to belong and they wanted everyone to believe. And then they learned how to behave in community with each other and as an example to the world around. So what do we do about it? What do we do? We keep first things first, which means that when we tell the story, we focus on Jesus. Now the Old Testament is scripture. I believe it's God breathed. I believe it's inspired by God. I don't think there's any error and I have absolutely no question about that. But all of the Old Testament isn't applicable in the same way that much of the New Testament or all of the New Testament is, because it's a book that was written to a group of people in times and places. It teaches us the story of God, the history of the Jewish people, points toward prophecy in the coming Messiah, communicates principles of character and demonstrations of faith that we learn from. So I'm not devaluing the Old Testament in any way. But when you're having a conversation with somebody, what's more important for them to learn? The story of Noah and the ark or the story of Jesus and the cross. And so it's very simple. You keep the gospel first. You keep Jesus first. It's the reason that we, for the last year and a half, have spent so much time talking about Jesus, where we've spent so much time focused on the gospels because I believe that it's the story of Jesus that's gonna change our lives and our world. So we focus we keep first things first. Now, there's time for all things later. For those of us who've been Christians for a long time, how would it be if we didn't know the story of Adam and Eve? How would it be if we didn't know the story of Abraham stepping out in faith before he even really knew God and the miracles that God did as he stumbled along in his journey? Moses and delivering the children of Israel from slavery in Egypt. Joseph and all the stories we've talked about. David. 
all of the stories of the judges, the prophecy. But that's not first, it's later. And it's important, it's just not most important. And so we keep Jesus most important. And so as we move forward in the next five weeks, this is how we're gonna do it. We're gonna be looking at some teachings of Jesus. We're gonna be answering the question, why should somebody follow Jesus if all they knew about Jesus was what he said about himself? Are all people really welcome in a relationship with Jesus? Can they belong just because they want to belong? Can they believe just because Jesus offered them the, the, the chance to believe? Can a life really be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, even though it's broken and doesn't bring much to the table like mine and like yours? And we're gonna do it by talking about things Jesus said don't do, which I'll, by the way, turn into things that we do do and that are so positive, these principles change your life. Thank you for your attention today. As I mentioned, a lot of information, but it sets the stage for where we're gonna be. And I think you're gonna love it. Father, thank you so much for my friends. And I